So welcome everyone. My name is Alan Slinkard. I'm a representative of the University of Colorado Boulder Staff Council. I'm also the Boulder Council's representative to the University of Colorado Staff Council, which is has members from each of the four campuses. Um, I would like to welcome you to this event, which is being hosted by the University of Colorado Boulder Staff Council and UCSC, as well as the Faculty Council and the student government. With that, I would like to turn this over for welcoming remarks from Chancellor Phil DeStefano. Chancellor. Thank you, Alan, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I wanna begin, first of all, by thanking everyone in our university community for their personal fortitude and persistence, and also for their dedication and devotion to the university, our students and our faculty during these troubling times. I also want to remind everyone to uh, take care of themselves, both mentally and physically. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our three new regents uh, to our Board of Regents. They were elected on November 3rd, and they will take office in January, serving six-year terms. As you may know, we have nine members of our Board of Regents. Seven are elected by their congressional districts and two at large and regents serve on a volunteer basis with no remuneration. With us today are region elect Norbert Chavez of Lakewood in the seventh con uh, congressional district, Callie Redison, region elect of Superior representing district two, and Alana Spiegel, region elect of Inglewood in the sixth congressional district. They all have CU connections and they have valuable public education and leadership experience. And I'll re introduce each one of them in alphabetical order and ask each one to spend uh, a few minutes uh, talking to the group before we move into our Q&A. Let's begin, of course, with Norbert Chavez. And Norbert Chavez's CU connections run deep. He's a CU Denver alumnus, a doctoral student, an employee, an adjunct faculty member, and a CU Denver parent. He served in the Colorado legislature from 1995 to 2002, earning a 100% voting record on both Colorado education and labor issues. Region Chavez serves as the chief of external initiatives and as executive director of City Center at CU Denver. City Center is where faculty expertise and student ingenuity are, maxed, are matched, I should say, with civic, nonprofit, and business leaders looking for fresh ideas and new approaches. Regent Chavez received his master's in political science and public policy from CU Denver and is enrolled in the Doctorate of Education and Human Development program at CU Denver. We're glad to have Regent Elect Chavez with us. Regent Chavez, you're on mute. <laughs> Can never get used to this. <laughs> hey, thank you, Chancellor. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to to, to be here. Uh, I uh, had the the uh, easiest race of all three of us because I was unopposed. Um, in the in the uh, primary and the general, which uh, I'm sure made Callie and, and Alana uh, jealous, um, but uh, I, I like to think that that um, my previous work in uh, in the legislature and and in the community uh, and here at CU helped to. Um, uh, uh, help to steer away uh, folks who, who might have wanted to run uh, against me, but um, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to, to be a part of the Board of Regents. And I really look forward to working together with everyone to kind of create a, uh, a new day and, uh, and, and to see how, um, see how we can all work together on common goals. And um, this is a wonderful opportunity to hear from all of you what your priorities are and, and issues are, and, and we'll be able to take those with us on day one and hopefully apply those to, uh, to our new role. So thank you, Chancellor, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, and next uh, is uh, Callie Renison, and uh, Professor Renison is 
a first generation college student and a community college graduate. Today, she is a professor in the School of Public Affairs on the Denver campus, where her research focuses on college students, women and marginalized groups. Callie has had vast experience in a variety of roles across campuses in the CU system. She served as the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs at CU Denver and as the Director of the Office of Equity and Title IX Coordinator at the Anschutz and Denver campuses. Regent-elect Renison earned her PhD in 1997 in political science at the University of Houston, where she also earned a bachelor and two master's degrees. She credits a professor for inspiring a major turning point in her life to pursue a graduate degree. Dr. Renison has taught undergraduate and graduate courses, including research methods, statistics, an introduction to criminal justice. A story in the CU Connections in 2016 noted that Callie hasn't necessarily lived by the numbers, but she's passionate about finding the truth behind them. She's an avid birder, uh, a rock climber for 20 years and road bike rider with a penchant for mountain passes. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Callie Renison. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, that kind introduction. And I'm really honored to be here to meet and listen to everyone today. Um, there's personal and professional reasons that drove me to want to run for Regent. Number one, I have the opportunity to serve in the public sphere. And I just have come to believe that living a good life quietly is not enough for us anymore. So I'm really excited to join the Board of Regents and to work on behalf of the student staff and faculty in the system and to be a part of the team that I think makes CU work better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regent. And uh, now for our third Regent, uh, Regent Spiegel. Ilana Spiegel is an educator and a CU parent. She has had a long career in public education. She's a champion for diversity, academic freedom, and budget transparency. Regent elect Spiegel has extensive experience in education, education policy, and government budgeting. She has devoted her life's work to serving students, teachers, and their families. As a teacher, she knows firsthand the power of education to transform lives and communities. Among her many education honors and the, is the 2018 recipient of the Colorado Education Association's Colorado Award for outstanding service in support of public education. She holds a BA in English and Economic from Wellesley College and an MA in Education from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Regent-elect Spiegel. Thank you so much, Chancellor DiStefano and everybody for putting on this call. It's um, truly an honor and a privilege to be here today. Um, and as Chancellor DiStefano said, I have the privilege and honor of serving the sixth congressional district. So the Anschutz Medical Campus is the campus that is in, in my district. Um, and uh, really, you know, one of the most common questions you get asked when you're running is, is, is why? why? Why are you doing this? And I really see an incredible opportunity for us um, to uh, make sure that CU is a flagship, not just for Colorado, but for our entire country, um, a place where young people from all different backgrounds can obtain a, a world-class education and a truly shining example of how a university could be run. Um, uh, you know, a little bit more about me and my background. Um, it's very important to, to who I am is uh, the family that I was born into was actually filled with depression and Holocaust survivors. And uh, something that most people don't know, um, which is really interesting and, and, and running for a political office is in that family, we, we didn't talk about politics or religion despite that background. Um, but we, my parents really just instilled in me values around hard work and fairness and, and being a good neighbor. And I really look forward to bringing um, those values to the work that I do on the board and with all of you. And um, really look forward to hearing from all of you about your priorities and, and how we can get that work done. Thank you.
Great. Um, with that, Chancellor DiStefano, thank you very much for the introductions. Thank you for the welcome. Regents Spiegel, Chavez, Renison, welcome. I'd like now to introduce our three moderators who will be uh, asking questions of our three regents, and they will do so kind of in random order. Um, I would like to introduce first Joanne Addison, who is the chair of the Faculty Assembly. Um, Isaiah Chavez, who is a student representative from the Boulder campus to the Intercampus Student Federation. And Ryan Untis, who is the chair of the University of Colorado Staff Council, which is, again, the group that has representatives from all four campuses. Um, if each one of you would like to take a moment to talk a little bit about yourselves before we begin, please feel free to do so. Let's begin with Joanne. Um, hi, I'm a faculty member on the Denver campus. I've been here for 26 years. I'm a professor in English. And, but for the last three years, I've been chairing the CU System Faculty Council. And so that's how I came to be one of the moderators here. And Ryan? Hello, I'm Ryan Untis, and I work in the Office of Human Resources at the CU Denver and Anschutz Medical Campus. Uh, and I've been the chair of the University of Colorado Staff Council for nearly the past two years, and that would be how I came to be one of the moderators as well. Happy to be here and looking forward to it. And finally, Isaiah. Hello, everybody. I am Isaiah Chavis. I am the uh, student body president on the Boulder campus, and this year I'm also representing all four campuses in the CU system at the ICSF, uh, which is why I'm here today with uh, the work that I do with the regents. Right. Well, again, welcome to all of you. And let's go ahead and begin with Joanne. So I'll just let everybody know that when we, we received many, many questions, far more than we can ask in the time that we have. So I'll apologize ahead of time for those whose questions aren't asked. And I also want to let you know that we did not edit the questions. So we are asking them as they were sent to us. Um, and the first question is one that um, we hear a lot. Uh, I would like to ask the new regents what ideas they might have for strengthening public investment, both financial and cultural in the university, which is after all an institution whose mission it is to serve the public. And perhaps Alana, perhaps we'll ask you to start. Sure. Thanks, Joanne. And, and um, what, what, a, what a great question um, in terms of uh, what, what more we can do to strengthen the public investments. Um, as uh, some of you may or may not know, here in Colorado, we fund higher ed 48th in the nation. Um, so we're, we're, we're down at the bottom in terms of, of state funding. And um, for many, many years, I've been an advocate uh, for uh, in, you know modest proposals um, to increase um, state funding um, to all of our institutions of education, both K-12 and higher ed. And I think we need um, strong advocates for that at the, the regent level. And I think um, I'm looking forward to bringing that voice there to um, ensure that we continue um, to advocate for additional state resources. Um, in addition to that, um, as uh, some of you may or may not know, the fastest growing groups of students who will be graduating um, from our K-12 system in the coming years, especially by 2025, um, will be low income students, first generation students um, and students of color. I'm really looking forward to working with our federal delegation um, to um, increase um, the scope and size of Pell Grant opportunities um, to simplify and modify the way we do our federal financial aid means testing. There's lots of things we can do to simplify that application process, um, make it perhaps part of um, tax filing so that people can automatically get that and make that federal funding um, more accessible and available to more students um, who need that. And then also really look to work both within the university system and at the state and federal level to you know, fundamentally reform the way we uh, finance um, higher education, in particular here in Colorado, and perhaps moving away from um, debt agreements to more income sharing agreements um, and uh, really looking at the way we restructure how that debt is paid back. So those are just a couple of the ideas that um, I think we can really look at to really strengthen um, our investments in um, our public higher education system. Thank you. Thank you, Nolbert. You're muted, Nolbert. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Sorry about that. God, um, <laughs> in my in my previous uh, life to uh, coming to work at CU, uh, I worked at the Capitol and 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 did a a fair amount of uh, lobbying um, the Joint Budget Committee and the legislature. Um, as Phil uh, said, I served in the State House for eight years, so oh. that was my area of expertise and. And, uh, and so I've watched over, over time um, the investment that the state has made in higher education um, dwindle. And, and, uh, and so I, I would love the opportunity uh, to, to be able to advocate for CU, the, the CU system um, at, the, at the Capitol. I mean, it, it certainly is not unique. I mean, this is happening you know, in state after state around the country. So it's not like uh, um, our state is, is, uh, is the only ones, but um, as Alana said, you know, advocating uh, uh, at the federal level, uh, you, you know, every way possible we, we, we need to do because, um, uh, let's see, okay. Um, because um, we, we're all in this together and we wanna make sure that CU continues to be the the flagship uh, um, in Boulder and, and the flagship system in in Colorado. So I'll I'll uh, put all my expertise towards uh, towards making sure that we get our fair share. Thank you. Thank you, and Kelly. Great. It's hard to uh, find additional things to what Alana and Nolbert have said, but I, I think I just want to hit on a few points. I think as regents, part of our role is to help educate the public mm -hmm. about the poor funding that the system receives, because on the campaign trail, I'm sure they can both uh, agree that people were shocked to discover how little money the system gets from the state. I think we all have to work as a team to advocate for legislation and things that support CU versus the other way. But we also have to demonstrate that we're uh, running a very lean organization, that we're not wasting money, that we are good stewards of tax dollars, and that we're using the money that we get to support our mission, that is education and research. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Ryan. Thanks, Joanne, and welcome to the three of you. We're very excited to have you join CU. Um, the next question is from the staff population, and I love this question. I'm excited to ask it, but um, what specific actions do you plan on taking once elected, or once sworn in, I'll say, um, to increase support for students, faculty, and uh, staff who are parents? And we'll start with Renison. We'll reverse the order, order for this time so that you can go first and maybe. Great, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot that we can do. And I think the pandemic has shown us some ways that we can be more supportive moving forward and dealing with parents with children um, in terms of more flexible work hours. One of my huge dreams, and this may be a long time coming, but I say that we go for it, has to do with improving the access to childcare on our campuses. Um, right now, yes, there's childcare available, but there's far too few slots. So I would love to see a great investment in that so that parents can have their children on campus being cared for where they can maybe share lunch, where breastfeeding can be conducted with the child right there. So I'd like to see a lot of that. And something that I've advocated for too, and that I'm going to definitely work toward is increasing the number of lactation rooms on all of our campuses, because currently there, there are not enough on any campus. We have entire buildings without these facilities and they're necessary. And without them, what it tells people who need these spaces is that they're not really welcome on our campuses and that's absolutely wrong. So these are some of the things that I wanna to do to help support parents in the future. Thank you, Regent Renison. Regent Chavez. So I'm, I'm a, a parent of, of a CU Denver student and um, I, I actually have been kind of surprised at how this has all gone. Um, uh, when, back in March, when when we went remote um, at CU Denver, uh, she really struggled and and had a, a difficult time, um, and and you know not through fault of her own or or for the or on the part of the faculty either. We were all thrown into this without any advance warning or knowledge, and 
and and she, we certainly struggled during that that semester and then over the summer uh, she got a little bit more used to and and the faculty members who were teaching the courses had a little more time to prepare for a remote learning scenario and uh, and then again this fall I asked her the other day uh, how are you do you know how are you doing how are you liking it um, you know I was afraid she was gonna she was gonna drop out and she said I I prefer online now I, I was shocked I mean, I was really shocked. And, and so what that tells me is, is uh, I don't know that we really know what the, uh, what the future is going to be like for, uh, for our students, what their preferences are going to be and how we should respond to, uh, to our students and, and their parents going forward. I, I think we, we're going to have to see how, how it plays out. Uh, if, if my uh, daughter is any indication, uh, she, she, she answered my question in a way that I had, I would have bet money that she would have said, I hate it and I, and I don't wanna keep doing it. And so for her to say, I, I wanna do it uh, as, a, as the primary way of, of receiving and taking classes, I was shocked. So um, I guess we'll have to see how it all plays out. Thank you. And then Regent Spiegel. Great. Thanks, Anne. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'll echo, um, you know, a lot of the thing that uh, I heard from my two colleagues in terms of, um, you know, uh, what, what, what Norbert was saying in terms of being being a parent myself of, of a student and, and a working parent, you know, you never know who's going to um, walk walk through that door right now. I, I have my own kids who are, um, you know, studying at home right now as well. So um, this is this is something I'm living um, as a as a parent right now. So um, and I think that um, that that gets it. You know what I shared earlier about I think first and foremost bringing uh, bringing those the values of, of hard work and fairness and being a good neighbor and I think what goes along with that is kindness and compassion and and, and a true true understanding and, and the fact that we'll, we'll listen to these concerns um, in addition to you know some of the concrete things that, that Callie talked about um, you know which which I also fully support um, as somebody who taught early childhood long long ago is really you know expanding what kind of opportunities are available to you um, you know, parents um, of, of younger children, um, you know, whether that's newborns and, and parents and, and moms in particular who need lactation rooms or the availability of childcare. I think that there are lots of innovative and creative ways we can we can uh, partner with the community to provide those, those opportunities. Um, you know, one of the other things that I'm really interested in, in diving into, um, you know, once, once I'm sworn in is what um, the passage of Proposition 118, the paid family and medical leave Act and exactly what what that's going to mean for our, our our faculty and our staff and our students who are parents at CU and and how that's going to be implemented. We saw overwhelming support for that initiative, um, in particular by by people who perhaps didn't have um, advanced or professional degrees. So I know that that's an issue that's extremely important for for working families and working parents. And um, I'm curious to see how, as a system, CU is going to implement that. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Spiegel, and thanks to the three of you for those responses. I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Isaiah. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Regents. Glad that you all could be here. Um, before I ask the question, you know, uh, it was already stated that we did get a lot of questions that we just inevitably will not have time to cover. Um, so retroactively after this, um, the Regents will have an opportunity to respond to some of the unanswered questions that we have to address here. Um, so this question stems from um, students and uh, other representatives who uh, we are representing on behalf of student government. The first question, uh, which comes up a lot in different ways uh, that has been requested is, what are each of your top three ways in 2021 you plan to show BIPOC students and folks of CU that they are a priority of yours and to that of the Regent Board? And we can start. Um, yep. Am I going first? Sure thing. Is that the order? I don't want to. I don't want to mess That's it fine. up. Okay. Yep. Um, so this is a big issue of, of mine, and and uh, if if any of if you followed 
my response to uh, some of the questions of us during the campaign. You may have read uh, what I'm going to tell you, but uh, it all goes back to uh, my time in the legislature when I was uh, a young man, <laughs> a much younger man, and uh, interested in, in this issue. And we were invited to the CU Boulder campus to talk about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and and we were we were uh, welcomed by uh, faculty and students, but there weren't any administrators there. There weren't any regents there. The president wasn't there. Um, and it was clear that that it wasn't a priority, right? It just was not a priority. And, and it, uh, it showed, and, and it's been, it's been, uh, it, it's played out over time that unless there is a priority from the highest level uh, that goes from the border regions to the president, to the chancellors, to the campus level, um, that those things won't change. And, and, um, and so it really is uh, something that I'd like to see. I've watched as an employee uh, here on the CU Denver campus, I've watched us um, qualify to become a Hispanic serving institution but that was not because we did any, really anything to, uh, to, to encourage that. The students themselves came. And, and, uh, and while we now are embracing that, uh, that uh, hopefully that designation here very soon, um, and we, we need to live up to that, um, it wasn't our uh, intention. We didn't. We did nothing really intentional to, to do that, and so I would like to see from a system level. Um, I would like to see a focus on uh, on those systems that keep um, students from being admitted, uh, faculty and staff from advancing, um, because I, I believe that we have a moment in time where. Um, where we can have those discussions about about systems of impediment. Um, if we were having this conversation a year ago, and I started talking about all the systems that were holding people back, people would say, "Come on, right? You're not going to you're not going to change that." Uh, but we have a unique uh, uh, moment in time where folks are saying, "Yeah, we need to we need to get that deep." And, and I'll tell you, those systems exist across the board that we don't even think about anymore. They are humming in the background, producing outcomes that we don't even recognize. We, 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 we take the, the results for granted. And, and, uh, and whether that's searches, whether you name it, uh, 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 the way our faculty are hired, uh, the search process, uh, you know, ACT score, SAT score. I mean, there are there are countless number of ways that that uh, hold people uh, back from achieving all that they can. And I would like to see uh, a focus on those systems being changed rather than just let's let's double the number of whatever. You know, I, I don't think that that really. I, I think that sets us up to fail because. Uh, the the systems are still in place to keep that from happening, and so uh, we'll be disappointed as uh, as a uh, as an organization if that's the approach that is taken, uh, and we and if we refuse to uh, take on those systems that really need to be changed. So that's a long answer, but it's a it's a big issue of mine and and one that I hope to. Um, to participate in and, and champion on the board. Awesome. Thank you so much, Regent, Regent Chavez. We appreciate that. I encourage also um, for the following responses to specify uh, the top three ways alongside oh. <laughs> uh, the thematic goals um, going forward. Uh, so we will we'll move on to Regent Spiegel. <laughs> Great. I, 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 you know, it's like that's, I, that's what I wrote down in my notebook in case anyone's a top three, right? Like the, the top three list. So I'll, 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 I'll start there. So I think, um, um, 
I, I think what's great though about following Norbert is that giving that high level theme that I think will underpin all of the answers that you'll hear. And I think it starts with um, respecting and listening to to our students and, and engaging them. Um, you know, I had the, the privilege, you know, while I was out campaigning with, with speaking with lots of students and lots of student groups and lots of diverse student groups and getting that feedback. And I think that that needs to continue. Um, you know, already have scheduled a, a first town hall um, with Representative elect uh, David Ortiz um, down here in Littleton, um, you know, to kind of live those values of respecting and listening to um, people that we heard on the campaign trail around some of these issues. So that I think that that's thing number one is continuing that process of respecting and listening to and making sure that we're getting um, feedback from diverse stakeholders on this issue. Um, I think a, a concrete thing, um, you know, for for, I'm only saying number two because it's the second thing I'm going to list, but it's an issue that I've been working on for a long time is really exploring alternatives to um, ACT and SAT as graduation requirements um, and entrance exam and for merit-based aid. Um, I think that they serve as an obstacle to graduation for many BIPOC students. Um, and a barrier to entry and a barrier to continuing um, in education because of lack of access to merit-based money based on those. Um, that's been a priority. It's been an issue I've been working on for many years and look forward to really um, continuing to make a, a top action item. And then uh, something I, I talked about an awful lot the past couple of months is, uh, you know, what role does an anti-racist creed play um, specifically on the Boulder campus as part of the Colorado creed, but at a systems level, um, you know, how do we make that part of the code of conduct? Um, understanding what it means to, to be an anti-racist and explicitly um, uh, talking about those issues. So those are just three examples. I actually have a top 10 list, you know, for people who want to want to follow up. Um, but those are those are three great examples I thought I'd share today. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. We will move on to Regent Renison. Great, thank you. I feel like I've been fidgety because this is such a topic that's really dear to my heart. I was looking forward to getting to answer it. And I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Alana and Nolbert have said. One of the cool things about campaigning is we certainly didn't all get together and decide to campaign, but we came together in one event and to hear how in alignment we are on this was really awesome. So a few things, and I know you asked specifically about BIPOC students, but I would like to expand the question because I think all of these answers also apply to other communities LGBTQ community, um, people in say wheelchairs or, or vision impaired and things like that, that we can do better for all. Number one, as Nolbert said, this is a systematic, systemic issue. It is a structural issue that continues this. And until we change the system and the structure, it's not gonna get better. And a brief way to say it is that we have to just burn the whole system down and start over. And this includes things like how we hire. Um, I believe that the way that we engage in hires and the way we engage in allowing students in allows this to continue. The use of hiring authorities, I'd like to investigate other ways to do that because what I've seen in action is that when candidates are presented to hiring authorities that don't look like the hiring authority, the searches frequently fail. We've got to find out a better way to do it. We are an institution of higher education. We have experts. There have got to be better ways to do it. This uh, number two is going to be, um, it's got to be more than hiring another vice president or chancellor of DEI. Is that I think that these are important positions, of course, but what I want to know is not just that we hired one, but do they have a budget? Do they have staff? What sort of programs are they looking to make real changes instead of it just being window dressing where we can point to our DEI person and say, see, we care. So that's got to be a part of it. And also we talk frequently about the lack of diversity that we see in the student and faculty populations, but I say it goes further than that. And I want us to also address the lack of diversity that we have in leadership and in staff positions. So I, I think that any audits that are done at the staff and faculty level need to be extended all the way through leadership because as I believe it was Michelle Obama said, you can't be what you can't see. So we need diversity from the top to the bottom. So those are the three things that I'd want to focus on specifically. Thank you very much. I will pass it to my colleague, Joanne. Uh, thank you, Isaiah. Uh, I, I, whose turn is it to go first? I, I don't know, I've lost track. It's either Alana's or Callie's, so. Hello. 
Al Alana, you get to go first. Okay, I have a completely different question. And what I would ask, um, I know these are big, important topics. If we can try to be brief so that Ryan and Isaiah and I can all ask two more questions, that'd be great. If we don't get to do that, that's fine. Um, but let's see if we can, let's see if we can make that a goal. Thank you. Um, and with that, I have a very long question to ask you. So I'll read it. You have it in front of you, I hope, as reference. Uh, I would like the regents to be asked what they think is the appropriate way to prevent the regents, as well as administrators, from violating regent law and policies. What mechanism might be put in place to decrease the probability that such violations would occur? Would the regents consider a nonpartisan oversight committee, for example? Um, let me skip a bit here. As an example of what I have in mind, consider a possible scenario in which Regent, Regent Law states clearly that the faculty are responsible for initiating policy concerning pedagogy and teaching, but the Regents unilaterally promote a particular agenda with regard to pedagogy and teaching, one that was neither initiated by and in many cases not supported by faculty governance. Okay, so I think the question in there, if I'm if I'm hearing that correctly, um, is is kind of that idea of of, of an oversight committee, and um, um, I think um, I think you know first and foremost, you know we have to look at what what what's in place in terms of of um, regent law and policy around shared governance, um, and shared governance very clearly. Um, states that it is um, the purview of the faculty to determine things like curriculum. So the the question I have in my role before I say let's get some outside person is 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 the is the policy correct and are the people involved um, adhering to to that policy? Um, so um, you know, am I opposed to an outside oversight? No, I mean I, I I think transparency and oversight and all of those things are an antiseptic um, on these wounds, and I think one. One of the things, though, that I'd really like to to bring forward um, is is really this lens of um, you know asking that question of what 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 did faculty think about this? What did staff think about this? What do the students think about it? As as we make a decision, um, as much as I come from an education background, and in terms of this particular question. Um, love to have conversations about curriculum and, and pedagogy and I'm happy to have them. That That is not the lane that we operate in as regents and um, I, I'm very, very clear about that. Um, I think though from a governing perspective, um, first we have to really look at is the policy as it's written the right policy? Is the process the right process or the right people involved? Um, and, uh, and, and, then, and then go from there. Um, but I think anything we can do to increase the, the, the transparency and accountability around that process um, to, to honor and respect and listen to our faculty and staff, um, I am all for that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, um, am I opposed to an external board? No, I'm not. Um, I'd be interested to see what it would look like, of course. I mean, I think one of the things that we need to do better in the future is to use the policies that we have. There are policies about what to do when regent law is broken. So we need to use those policies if we need to be. I also think we have to do a better job of calling each other out. If I break policy, I would hope that people step forward and talk to me. I would hope that my colleagues on the board would also talk to me and um, that that's got to be a part of it. We can't just all, um, gang together to break those rules because it's something we want. We have the regent policies for a reason and we need to follow those. Um, so in short, not, not opposed to an external board, use the tools that we have and to use our own voices and to listen to the people in the system when lines are being crossed because they should not be crossed. And Nolbert. So I guess uh, the way I read, the way I heard the question, it sounds like it was based on the um, civics uh, decision that the board made to create curriculum that, uh, that the faculty had not uh, had any say in, um, which I agree is, uh, is, is um, not respecting the idea of shared governance. So the question is, do we accept that or do we create a separate oversight committee because it's not being uh, respected in the first place? So the, the answer to that would be no. 
uh, I don't think we should create a separate um, entity because the first entity is not doing what they should be doing. I think we should be doing what we should be doing and respecting regent law in the first place. And then we don't need an, an external um, um, oversight committee uh, as a workaround, right? Or as, a, as, a, as an additional check. So um, I, I, I don't support the way that that happened. Um, and and I, I think that it was a, a breach of, of our um, authority, responsibility, re the regent law at play. And, um, and we should just do our job and, and, and let you guys do your job as, as a faculty to come up with, with um, curriculum. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Isaiah, back to you, please. Well, I think I'm gonna, was it? Yeah, yeah I think it's, I'll- It's Ryan. I'll take that one. Um, thanks, Joanne, and thanks, Regents, Regent Select. Um, so this next one regards uh, House Bill 1153, which is um, an act concerning the formation of unions between um, workers and state-run enterprises and agencies. So with the recent passage of House Bill 1153, how do you see the Regents supporting the formation of collective bargaining units within the system? And what insight might you have for the campuses as they proceed to wade into this uncharted territory. And again, I can't keep track of who we're starting with either. So we'll go with Regent Renison. I think it's me, yeah. Um, this will kind of be a short answer. As I campaigned, I was very clear that I support unions. I'm a former union member myself when I worked at the Department of Justice. And um, I think unions are fantastic. So I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for other people on the board or how the board would react, but I can tell you that I am supportive of that. So um, I think I'm next. Uh, <clears throat> as as uh, Chancellor DiStefano uh, indicated in my introduction, um, I had a 100% voting record with labor when I was in the legislature. Um, but I, I must say that that uh, what I'll be looking for uh, going forward is is the the relationship that exists. And, and let me explain what I mean. Um, my experience since since uh, I left the legislature has been one where um, I've I've been able to see sort of both sides. Um, I've, I, I had um, clients that had uh, unionized uh, uh, workforces and, and the, the relationship was um, strained at every turn uh, because it needed to be in order for uh, for for the tug of war to continue, the minute someone stopped tug, tugging, right, it sort of fell apart, and and uh, and so what? So I, I've seen instances where where it uh, can really destroy a, a, a relationship between um, an employer and its employees uh, based on this constant antagonistic sort of relationship. I, I completely uh, agree that um, unions have their, their place and their role and they're very valuable. Um, but, but I'll be looking to see how that plays out in, in the future and, and, and how it should apply to, to us uh, going forward because um, I don't want it to go too far one way or the other and and have a, a relationship that is that is um, uh, spoiled um, as a result so that's that's uh, that's where I am on that thank you Regent Chavez and then Regent Spiegel Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks for the question. And um, I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, you know, like Callie, um, you know, I, I ran um, a campaign with a, a lot of um, labor and union support and, um, you know, was a union member myself and um, fully support that. I see 
um, you know, uh, in, in broad general terms, um, unions and, and labor um, collective bargaining are what allow more people to access the middle class. Um, so, but like Norbert, um, you know, I, I've seen where the negotiations work well and where they don't. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the formation of these units and the relationships they have, because ultimately, um, you know, union re representing staff, faculty, administration um, is often likened, you know, to three legs of a stool with, with, with students and, and um, you know, kind of sitting on top of that stool and you get that two out of whack and you're gonna, um, you're, you're gonna throw, throw the, the mission and the purpose of what you're doing um, out, out of whack there. So, um, you know, yes, completely support it. Um, how, um, how that goes against, uh, how that goes about being implemented and put into practice um, is, is what's gonna be um, kind of the work that needs to be done um, on the campus level and at the system level, um, but know that in, in theory and um, in terms of values that it's something that, that I support. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you for the answers to that question. And now I'll turn it over to Isaiah. Thank you very much. All right, so this next question is a, a two-part question um, focused on one of the biggest conversations going on, not only on uh, the Boulder campus and the CU system, but really it's a nationwide conversation. Um, so mental health has been at the forefront of the needs of students, faculty, and staff. How have the regions helped to acknowledge the harm that our current population is dealing with? And what are ways that you are planning to help during your term? I forgot the order as well, so. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm first. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I know all the ways that, <clears throat> that um, students have been um, um, treated and, and, and given opportunities for, for, for mental health support and treatment. I know that on the Denver campus, there has been a focus on our students and, their, and the need for, for mental health um, services. And, and, it, it, and it has been a conversation that has included the chancellor and the cabinet and, and uh, senior administrators uh, on the campus and the desire to partner with community mental health centers and and uh, other providers in the community that can serve our students on the Denver campus. But as it relates to the other campuses, I don't know that I, I don't have the information to to answer that question. Um, I think that it certainly uh, I believe that it is a priority and that it certainly should continue to be. And as a regent, I would um, encourage and support um, the support of our students in that way through, through the campuses uh, that they, that they uh, attend. And I, I think it probably will vary from campus to campus exactly what you'll see as, uh, as ser services that are available on each campus, but in general, I, I support that completely. I recognize it, and and I do believe that that those conversations have uh, have happened and and are continuing to to happen on on each campus. Thank you very much. We will go to Regent Spiegel. Great, thank you so much. Um, what what an important question um, in terms of uh, the mental health needs of our students. It's something that I'm seeing every day as a parent um, with with my own kids, and it's something that that predated um, COVID. Um, when I think about you know uh, many of our undergraduate and graduate students today, um, you know they were um, going to high school and college as we saw uh, mental health needs increasing. We saw rates of of suicide and depression. Um, among young adults and teenagers um, skyrocketing. So this was an issue um, before COVID hit. And I think this is one of the many issues that, that COVID has exacerbated, whether it's because of isolation or um, uh, you know, food or housing insecurity. Um, you know, lack of, of access in, in person to the resources that people need. Um, so I think we saw a crisis that was happening before COVID only accelerate during COVID. Um, 
you know, in terms of um, what, what I can bring to that conversation is once again, um, th this is a, a tremendous value that I have. I, um, you know, uh, come from a family of psychologists and psychiatrists and school counselors, and it's something that um, is a, a, a tremendous value. And I think one of the things that we need to do, and I'm very grateful for the CU Foundation for putting additional funding to mental health services, but I think we need to make sure that those are um, reaching students in the most um, effective ways possible and that students know how to access um, those resources. And I think um, really reaching in and, and figuring out, um, is, is that happening? How is that happening? And what do we need to do to make sure that those resources are getting directly to students to get the support that they need um, is, is a huge priority of mine. But thank you so much for that question. Thank you for your response. Regent Renison. Great. Yeah, I think that um, when we're talking about mental health of our students, staff, and faculty, this is this is a topic where I've seen the university and the system get better and better over time. Do we, do we have more improvement that's needed? Absolutely. But especially with COVID, the number of emails as a faculty member that I receive reminding us about self-care, here are places we can go to get help. Here are places to send students who are challenged or need assistance has, has really, really changed over time. I sit on what's called the FAST team, which is our faculty and staff, kind of like the number you call if you're afraid that they're struggling. And we work very hard and very diligently to ensure that faculty and staff are um, contacted, given resources and assisted in times of need. We also have similar uh, types of programs that work with our students. So yes, I think it's something that we've started doing far better than we used to. It's still, the need is greater than what we've been able to handle. And I'm really thankful for the increase in funding that we've recently seen. Like Alana said, I'd like to ensure that this is getting to the uh, people that need it the most and that we continue to do a better job of letting people know who to contact when this is needed. So as a region, I will continue to support this and to try to make sure that everybody who needs that help is receiving it. Thank you, Regent. Um, and I'd like to note that we only have about seven minutes before we move on to the Q&A section from the live feed. Um, so I think we might have time for one more question uh, from Joanne. Okay, so we will go ahead and... Ellen, were you trying to speak? You're muted. I was just going to say we can go until about uh, five or five or seven seven minutes after. So feel free. Go ahead. Okay, um, Al Alana, this goes to you first. Uh, the question: uh, I would like to know how the regions define principled leadership. For example, the furloughs and salary cuts were not principled in that they were not equitable. That is, people earning three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, eight hundred and fifty thousand, and more were only asked to take a 10% cut, which has almost no material effect on their lives, while many making $65,000 were asked to take a 5% cut, which certainly has a material effect on their lives. If we don't have evidence of principled leadership during a crisis, how are we to trust we will have it during more normal times? Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. And I would add to that term principled leadership about, um, you know, equitable ways of, of dealing with these issues. Um, I do think and, uh, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I do think that, um, you know, the CU Denver campus, there were um, pro uh, progressive um, furloughs and salary reductions, um, which was not true across all of the campuses. And I think that that, um, you know, as we continue to go forward with re-examining um, budgeting models and weathering future economic um, crises is something that we very much need to look at, a 10% a, a um, furlough or cut on a $400,000 salary is very different than, than a 10% cut on, on a $70,000 or less salary. Um, so I think we need to really look at how we're more equitable um, in terms of um, some of the reductions and some of the ways that um, we address these issues. Thank you, Kelly. I'm going to echo exactly what Alana said. I think transparency is number one being very open. Let me also say too that the choices for how furloughs and pay cuts went were campus level decisions. These weren't decisions that regents make, but I'm in agreement with the person who sent the question that I don't think the furloughs were principled. It's, it's odd to me that as a faculty member on Denver, I have a bigger pay cut at lower salaries than the faculty sitting on other campuses. It shouldn't be that way as a system. It should be a little more equitable across the board. 
and that cutting it off at 10% above a certain number I don't think was appropriate. Uh, something else is I speak a lot about institutional courage and that's courage on behalf of each individual too, is that not only do we need to be transparent, but we have to lead with courage. And even if it's something that might hurt me personally, it shouldn't matter. We're, our job as regents is to do what is best for the people of the system and uh, right there. Also, let me just say, I mentioned it earlier, but we are an institution of higher education is full of amazing internationally renowned researchers who have best practices on things like this. So I think that we need to do a better job of accessing, accessing the expertise that we have in our system and using it to, as, as a way to lead. Thanks. Thank you, and Norbert. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Callie that, uh, that the decision was made at the campus level. It was not made at the regent level. And, and so uh, I imagine that there were differences between the campuses, but at the CU Denver campus, uh, I, uh, uh, I heard uh, all the conversations around the principles that were going to be applied, and 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 the intention was for it to be as equitable as possible. And and so the folks that were making the least took the least uh, percentage uh, cut, um, and and then went up. So um, you know, I I don't know um, if there was a better way to do it. I'm sure there probably are many different ways of that we could have done it, but uh, but I know that the intention was certainly to be equitable on the on the CU Denver campus, and and uh, I I shouldn't comment on how other ca campuses did it because I was not privy to those conversations. Okay, Ryan. Okay. So Ryan, let's uh, go ahead and do one more question. And then we'll move into the Q&A that's in the portal. Sorry about that. Thanks, Alan, and I appreciate it. This last one sort of begins to tie back to the first question, but I want to emphasize a part of this question, I think, that gets at our finances in a different angle, too. So what can and should the regions do to create a more solid financial footing for the university, including possibly a cushion that we can draw from in times of budget stress like the present one. And again, I've lost track of who we'll start with. So we'll, Callie. I think it's, I think it is me. It does tie to what we spoke about a little earlier. And that is that I think that one of the important roles of Regents is to work with the legislature in figuring out ways to better fund higher education so that we're not finding ourselves in positions like we are right now. There is a cushion. Um, I am not an expert on that cushion, so I don't wanna talk about it in great length. And it has been used in some fashion during this time. But I think that the bigger priority is that we've got to, if, if we're a state and we're people that care about higher education and we say we do, we're a state that requires a highly educated workforce. We know this and we know that we don't have enough people, then we have to fund it. We have to show, show it is a priority through funding from the state. So educating the public about the importance of it, educating the legislature, finding innovative ways to help fund, uh, maybe in different ways, I think are all absolutely key. Great, thank you. So, no so when I was first elected back in 1994 to the state house, the state had less than a 2% reserve uh, for itself. And it took, it took uh, uh, decades uh, and, and uh, legislation in order for that uh, percentage of reserve to be increased. Uh, because, of course, everyone wants you to spend the money that you've got coming in uh, on, 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 on them, right? On, on salary increases and, and uh, buildings and uh, curriculum, everything. Um, and so when you tell folks, well, um, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend part of it, we're going to put it in reserve, you've got, you've got those who would oppose that. And, and so it is a difficult um, scenario to to uh, to get to the point where you want to be but it's it's got to be incremental I think that's the that's the only way that it really happens without uh, causing too much pain and um, and and one that uh, that you know it's it's like the um, 
ancient Chinese proverb, right? The, the, the very best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago. The second best time is today, right? We should start today. It would be, have been great to have done it uh, 10 years ago and started to uh, to sock money away for uh, times like like now, but we but we haven't. And, and so um, we might as well start today. Thank you. And then Regent Spiegel. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, like Callie said, and as we said before, I think, you know, one of the issues is, you know, we, we have to decide um, if we're going to be a 100% tuition based uh, institution and not rely um, at all on, on state funding, um, or if we're going to, um, you know, value, um, you know, public higher education and invest more from the state level and um, really be bold and, and advocate for that that investment and that funding um, from the state. Um, I do think that um, one of the reasons CU as a system was better able to um, weather um, the current economic and, and health crisis is because of the reserves and the really, uh, you know, fabulous management of, of the budget that there was there was a cushion there. Um, as a whole, higher ed never recovered. Um, from the 2008 recession here in Colorado, when CU was in a much better place to be able to weather that because of some things that were put in place in terms of reserves and that cushion. Um, and I do think that there were conversations that began once again, prior to COVID um, about addressing those issues. I think there were some communications that went out today about um, changing budgeting models um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, rethinking how we allocate resources, what can be rolled over, what can't be rolled over, um, how that will allow us to, to, to streamline and be more efficient and better weather storms. I think that there are um, pros and cons for these systems. Um, you know, I've worked in, in other education systems rolling out different budgeting models. And I think, um, you know, one of the things we should be looking at is how does it allow us to better weather, weather these downturns that we, we know will, will come. Um, but I think really examining our budgeting practices and not not just doing it because that's the way we've always doing it is a, is a really great place to start. Um, I was heartened to see that those conversations had started um, prior and that they're, they're, they're starting up again and, and look forward to seeing how that plays out at a system level and then, you know, I'll just and with we did we did some um, great work at the state level with rewriting the higher education funding formula um, in terms of incentivizing students that are served and making sure that resources are going to students that need it the most and are tend to be more expensive to educate and really looking at um, how once the money comes into the CU system how is that getting allocated um, to to each campus to best meet the needs of our students going forward. So thank you. All right. Thank, Thank all of you for your participation at this point in time. We're going to move now to the audience Q&A component. And what I would like to do is uh, in the chat area, um, our moderators have each selected one of the questions that they would like to begin with. So I would like Joanne to go ahead and begin with her question. Thank you. Uh, here's the question that I've pulled from the um, from the chat because it's uh, very different from any of the questions that have been asked and answered thus far. Polls from multiple sources show that trust in universities among both Republican and independent voters has dramatically declined since 2015. Um, why do each of you think this is the case and what do you plan to do about it? Do you want uh, me to start with that one, Joanna? Yeah, or, please. I ended do. with the last one. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. No. No. No problem. Yeah. So I think that that's. Um. You know. I think that there's. There's. Um. There's a, the, those polls are reflecting a fundamental undermining of uh, the, the trust in public education as a whole, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, and what that provides both to the future of our democracy and, and our workforce. I think um, that those polls are reflected of, of many, many years, actually many decades, um, of, of a message um, that uh, you know, that these institutions and, and these ideals um, should be privatized or corporatized or, um, you know, bringing in more market-based models to them. So I think that that's what the polls are reflecting. And I think it's our job as regents um, to really um, use use the, the, the platform that we have to talk about why public education in particular, higher education is so important, um, both to the future of our democracy and to the future of our workforce. Um, 
to make sure that the public knows in addition to all these things that we've been talking about about funding, how on average people with a bachelor's degree earn a um, million dollars more over the course of their, their, their uh, work lifetime than people without a bachelor's degree. How we're at a point in time where more and more jobs are demanding a post-secondary degree or, or a credential, um, and the cost of obtaining that degree has, has skyrocketed. But I think it's our job to make the case that higher education works and how important it is um, to, to the future, to the future of, our, of our state and, and of our country. And, and that's part of our job is to make the case that it works. So I really look forward um, to being able to do that alongside incredible faculty and, and staff and students. Thank you, Kelly. That is a hard answer to follow up because it was perfect. It's exactly right. It's our job to show that higher education is important. It's not only important in terms of returns on investment, right, and salary earnings, but also just the value and quality of life that it leads, the difference it makes for educated people's children to then follow behind them. So I think, again, we have to show that we're uh, managing the system well, we're using money wisely, and the degrees that we offer um, provide skills that are very important moving forward. I mean, I still hear a lot of people who talk about, well, you shouldn't offer degrees in underwater basket weaving. That's just ridic ridiculous rhetoric that some people say. And frankly, a lot of that rhetoric comes from people who've spent no time on university campuses to see the value of what we do. So we just have to do a better job of showing what we do and how valuable it is for the state of Colorado and the people in it and beyond. Thank you, and Nolbert. <clears throat> I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I've worked with employers in my position who uh, have the opportunity and take the opportunity to share with us uh, directly what positions and skills they're, they're looking to, to fill, what their needs are. And, 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 and that is a, a, a real world everyday conversation that happens. So that we're matching, um, you know, those skills and, and abilities with the jobs in the marketplace. Um, if we if we weren't doing that, we would have a lot of unemployed folks that have taken, you know, uh, chosen majors that that couldn't find, uh, you know, couldn't find positions after they graduated, and and so it's incumbent upon us to continually do that. To make sure that our uh, our students have have a path towards their career beginning as soon as they're done. Thank you all, um, Isaiah. I would like you to take the question that you had selected from the Q and A and go ahead and ask that question, and we'll begin with Regent Spiegel this time. Awesome. So there's a couple. I'm going to start with uh, one that I think is more relevant to the current times we're living in, and a big question that's growing. Um, are the new regents interested in giving their attention to the CU administration's strong push to greatly expand online instruction? Regent Spiegel, we can start with you. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that this is, is such a great question and is so important. And one of the things that I'm really curious about at this moment in time is, is the increased demand for online education just because of the circumstances or is it truly, um, is it truly something we're gonna see um, transcend um, this current crisis. Um, you know, I do fundamentally believe that an online education can provide opportunities for, for working students, uh, students in rural areas, um, you know, uh, people um, who are already in their career trying to obtain a, you know, a post-secondary degree, an opportunity to, to get that degree. But fundamentally, the backbone of what makes the University of Colorado great and what makes, you know, CU so phenomenal is hands-on learning in the classroom. Um, so, I think we, we can't lose sight of that. Um, we have some of the greatest faculty and staff on the planet here. And I just wanna make sure and ensure that um, any online courses are designed um, and taught by our professor, our professional professors and educators and you know, not, not by companies or people looking to just make a buck off of the back of, of our students. Um, so I, you know, I think once again, the, the, the pandemic has highlighted the premium and value that many people place on any 
in person or even a residential campus experience. Um, and you know, it's also highlighted the importance of a robust online strategy. Um, I think we need to really make sure, though, that that it is once again, and from a shared governance perspective, that this is something that faculty and staff are fully involved of, um, that they they're designing the curriculum, um, and that they uh, you know own own the rights to that, and they're the ones that are teaching that, um, and should be fully involved in those decisions. Thank you, Regent Renison. Yes, um, yes, I am supportive of increasing our online presence, but with caveats, as Alana mentioned, that online courses need to be taught by the same faculty, it needs to be the same material and the same quality as we offer in person. Uh, online isn't new in the CU system. On my campus, we've been using it for over 10 years with exactly the strategy and we've been very successful. And I also wanna highlight that while a lot of our students have the on-campus dorm type traditional student experience, a whole lot of our students don't have that opportunity or privilege. And offering online courses and online degrees where you can jump back and forth from in-person to online because they're the same quality has given so many of our students an opportunity to get a degree. This past semester, I taught graduate level research methods and one of my students is a police officer. So on, on camera, I would see her patrolling around. She was able to take the course and is gonna be able to get her degree because of the flexibility that online offers. She couldn't have attended it in person. So yes, I support it. It has to be taught by our great faculty. The curriculum has to be by our great faculty and it has to have the same value. Um, and I think that I'm gonna leave it right there. So yes. I, 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 I agree as well. I mean, I, I think the, um recognition that a, that an online student is a different student perhaps at least it may have been in the past who knows it, what it will be in the future but it, it may have been a different type of student than than that student fresh out of high school looking for a college experience uh, similar to what Callie just just described it may be a, a working adult a parent uh, someone who who didn't have that opportunity when they were out of high school or didn't finish whatever it may be and and they need they recognize the need to to finish it so yes we we absolutely need to fill that need and and uh and and address that market um csu global and other institutions have embraced that uh, much earlier than we did and and have found lots of success at it and uh, and so we we need to do our part to to uh, provide uh, that opportunity for CU students as well. Awesome. I'll pass over to oh, go ahead, Alan. Sorry. Yeah. So Ryan, go ahead and select one of the two questions that you have chosen. Thanks, and I'm actually going to go with a question that came in pretty early during the um, event. So. In normal times, Colorado has so many unfilled jobs. What programs or partnerships would you propose to start or enhance to help keep CU graduates in the community and contributing to our economic resilience and growth? And we can start with Regent Chavez. Um, I guess I, I would need a little bit more information uh, as to what they're referring to to really answer their question the way they probably want. But uh, let me say this, that, that I've participated in uh, as part of my role here at CU Denver, uh, a study research uh, project that some of our CU Denver students and faculty uh, were a part of along with the Brookings Institute and the downtown and the uh, Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce to look at what our, our uh, economy really looks like, whether it's an equitable, economy, whether there's opportunity for folks to, to number one, get a job and move up in, in, um, in that role or in their careers, what barriers exist. And, and while we didn't get into what areas are, are there unfilled jobs, which was part of the question, I do think, though, there, there have been uh, conversations about how do we adapt in order to fill those uh, areas that need attention and those areas that don't. And, and, and that has been a, a partnership and a, 
and a conversation that's happened not only at the campus level, but it's happened at the city level as well with employers. And, and it's got to be that sort of conversation, that give and take for us to know what those needs are and will continue to be in the future so that we can uh, prepare our students for them. I don't think it's enough for us to kind of guess or, or react too late. Um, it needs to be a, a conversation that happens um, continually. Thank you. And Regent Renison. Yeah, um, I see this happening a lot with our students. My students graduate and many of them are moving away. They're not necessarily moving away because of something about CU though, they're moving away because the cost of living here is too high. So I think that it's our job also to continue to work with the legislature to try to figure out programs that can assist our newly graduated people where they can afford to live here. These are things that we hear floated around at the national level like student loan forgiveness, which I would be a huge, I am a huge fan of, or um, working with the legislature on some creative housing program so that young people coming out of college and other places can afford to live here. And we're not having to send our well uh, educated people off to the state of Washington or Texas or other places where they can afford to make a living. So I, I know that many schools, mine included, we have a lot of great connections with external companies. We have internships and capstones that require them to connect with these groups and they often do lead to jobs and job opportunities. So I think we have to keep that up and we have to expand it. And I think as regents, we need to figure out if there are ways that we can better support schools in that effort. Thank you. And last, but most certainly not least, Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so I mean, what a, what a great question. So, um, and as I was listening to, to Kelly and Norbert respond to that question and, and looking at the question that was talking about um, current unfilled jobs, um, but you know, with, a, with an eye to the future, um, and I think this piggybacks on that, that online question about how to engage people, I think as we, we, we think about kind of the future, it's what, what else is available in terms of the education our students are receiving at CU and the opportunities that provides for them to um, to get jobs when they graduate. And um, I've been a huge advocate and worked very hard in, in the K-12 space for apprenticeships um, and partnerships where uh, business and industry really talk about specifically here are the skills that I need, but really what, what's different than just an internship or, or an externship is this idea of then working collaboratively with faculty and staff where they design the curriculum to meet those needs. And when students graduate, you know, with these specifications in, the, in these areas, Areas and with these classes, um, part of their, their experience is on site at some of these places and they both are able to earn an income which reduces um, some of their, their costs or they could um, have some of their credits paid for um, by, by these companies. Um, and it really guarantees them a job. I think that that's really the future of where we see it going. We see the Department of Higher Ed is rolling out their collegiate apprenticeship program and would love to see, see you be a part of that because I think that that's gonna help ensure that we're matching um, both the, the skills and the knowledge that our students are gaining with what employers are looking for when they're graduating and that they graduate right into that job. They actually are starting some of that training um, while, while they're in school. Um, so I think that the, the apprenticeship model is is a really great one to look at what that looks like um, in, in higher ed, both undergraduate and graduate school. All right, thank okay. you. Three. Oh, sorry. I was wondering if I could jump in with a question that was one of the advanced questions that generally gets at a number of the things that more specific issues that have been asked in the chat, if that would be okay. Please feel free to do so. Okay, so the, the more general question that I think covers some of the specific ones from the chat that I received was, are there any recent resolutions or decisions of the current Board of Regents that the incoming board would like to reverse or bring forward for more conversation and perhaps revision? So want me to, 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 to start, want to go reverse order again or? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think, you know, for me, um, 
you know, I'd, I'd like to see us, um, you know, revisit Regent Kroll's resolution from June um, and really look at um, what's what's been done and really um, what's what's working in terms of uh, some of the issues around uh, racial and, and social justice um, and making sure that that our students and faculty and staff feel heard in that area and acknowledging um, the great work that is, is already being done around that and what more can be done. Um, and I'm really committed to, to working to bring some of those issues forward and come up with some concrete action items um, you know, for, for our students, faculty, and staff around racial and social justice. Kelly? I am sitting here. I don't know that I can add to anything that Alana has said because I completely agree that Regent Kroll's resolution, I definitely want to see that come forward again and make sure that it's covering the social justice areas that support the people in the system. So I'm an absolute advocate of that. And, and I would simply say that I'd like to see the same, but I'd like to see an eye towards systemic barriers uh, that I don't think were in that particular draft um, because of the makeup of the board at that time. Um, I, I'd like to see that added. All right, we have time for probably one more question before we get ready to close. I'm going to allow Isaiah to go ahead and ask the last question. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, this is one from the chat. I'm gonna preface this by saying uh, conversations about tuition in general, uh, given COVID and other factors has been a conversation that's been ongoing um, even before the pandemic began. Um, so with that, the question is with CU Boulders, and you can asterisk for other campuses, great dependency on out-of-state tuition dollars, is it feasible to imagine that remote learning is the future of the university? How many parents, no matter how wealthy, will be willing to pay out-of-state tuition and fees to have their children staring and learning through a laptop? And I also forgot the order, so I'm sorry. We can start with uh, Regent Renison. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me make sure that I catch this. So one thing to keep in mind is that the regents have been able to keep tuition stable the last several years, and this is something to celebrate, but I'd also say that tuition is too high, but happy that it hasn't gone higher. And in terms of is remote the future, I think remote is absolutely part of the future. It is not the whole future. We're not looking to turn into an online only university, but if we want to reach the people out there that are in need of higher education, then remote has to be a part of it. Um, we're not going to sell the Boulder campus and make it go remote. But I think what it is, is that we're going to be building out the fuller capacity of the university that we're going to continue to allow people once COVID is gone to come to campus to live that traditional experience. But we've got to do a better job of opening our doors for everybody else who can't do it. I mentioned my student last semester who was a police, who's a police officer and how online and remote has allowed her to pursue her degree. I've also had students sit in my class who live in Colorado Springs, but don't have childcare issues. So we've got to make remote a part of the future. It's not gonna be all of the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Callie. We, we sort of touched on this earlier. It, it's a, a segment of, of the um, population that needs to be served or wants to be served through an online course. But I would guess that the minute uh, on-campus experiences are allowed again, CU Boulder is going to be full of students that want that and, uh, and are, are not going to choose uh, an online experience uh, like they've had to, um, to do uh, thus far. So uh, I think it's, it's part of the mix of, of students. And, uh, and, and, the, and the truth is there are those who are interested in and willing to pay for on our, our campuses and throughout the country, a traditional college experience that, that, it, that is of paramount importance to them and, and then there are those who do not. And, and it's, it's incumbent upon us as a, a board of regents to make sure that we're prepared to serve all of those. Great. Um, you know, I'll just add, add a couple of things. Um, you know, one is um, I think what, what's important to remember is that the cost of delivering um, and online education isn't necessarily any less. We're still having to pay for faculty 
um, staff, uh, technology. We, we still have all of our buildings and on all of those costs um, are, are still there, even um, with, with an online education. So um, I think that that's, that's one thing um, to keep in mind, um, you know, um, that, that doesn't necessarily um, lower the cost. Um, you know, in terms of that, that out of state question, you're, you're right, Boulder in particular is incredibly dependent on out of state and international students for tuition. And as a result, the rest of the system is dependent on that revenue. Um, so I think, there's going to come a point in time, and I think we were kind of there, regardless of COVID, where we have to have a real conversation about our, you know, how are we going to best serve Colorado students? And as I mentioned earlier, um, we have to look at the demographics of Colorado students and how we're going to make sure we can en enroll them in in the experience that's going to best match what they need, whether it's a rural student who wants a, a CU degree, um, you know, and is able to access that through through an online or a remote program, or um, it's students that really Really want to have that in-person residential or or on-campus experience even if it isn't residential um, so that, but those are the students we're going to need we're going to need to reach here in Colorado and make sure that they have access and are able to afford that um, you know and, and I would say you know tuition is is high right now because the burden is primarily on families and students with very little state support and that, that's what we need to remember relative to peer institutions our tuition is very very low what may, what's sets us apart is the amount that families and students have to pay towards that relative um, to, to other um, peer institutions across the country. Isaiah, can I say one thing too that I just want to make sure gets out there? Some people have this notion that there are in-person students and online students and they're totally dis, you know, different from each other. But what we know from experience on our campuses is that often our on-campus dorm living students or our uh, in-person students are also taking online. So the flexibility doesn't just go to certain populations. That flexibility is available to all of our students. So I just wanna make sure people understand that it's not like two completely discrete populations we're talking about. There's bleed over and that's a good thing. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for your time and answering the questions. We appreciate it. So we are running close to time. So I would, like as your moderator to first of all say thank you very much to our regents uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, it's been wonderful to pick your brain and get a sense of what we can look forward to going into 2021 and beyond. Um, to our moderators, thank you very much for all, uh, all that you do in the form of shared governance on each one of the individual campuses that you represent. And for those people who had asked questions in the portal about uh, where, whether there will be a recording of this available, there will be. And we will do the best we can to take the remaining questions that were not asked. And if the regions have time, we will forward them on to them. And if they can provide answers briefly um, at their leisure, we will in an article in uh, CU Boulder today and CU Connections sometime after the first of the year, try to publish those as best we can. So with that, I'd like to, again, thank all of you, our moderators, our regents, Chancellor DiStefano for joining us. We thank you all for participating today in this uh, Regent Welcome Forum and hope you all have a wonderful weekend and that you stay safe. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you.